Hi, my name is Charles Dark, and welcome to the After Dark Show. Today I will be sharing some stories. I hope you enjoy. And I heard Lauren Vanderwall's parents are going to Boston for the weekend. Angie was saying as she hogged the only stool behind the register. Misty Johnson and Feather Haynes were talking about it in the ladies. There'd been a big sale at Overton's, and Nina was tired from the rush of customers. Her feet hurt. She wouldn't have minded a turn on the stool. But Angela's parents owned Overton's, and if Nina didn't want Angela to complain to her mother about her, there wasn't much she could say in protest. She didn't think Mrs. Overton would fire her. Nina was one of Overton's best employees, but Mrs. Overton might reassign one of her valuable weekend shifts. Nina couldn't afford to lose either of those. Saturday and Sunday were the only eight-hour shifts she could take because of school. Nina told herself she didn't care too much about not getting to sit down. She kept her mind off her sore feet by calling the mall radio station approximately every 15 minutes and asking them to play her favorite song, The Night Hunter. Jerry, who was on duty at the sound desk, kept saying, No problem. But he never played it. Nina hadn't really expected him to, since The Night Hunter wasn't exactly the kind of song the Calder Mall played over its sound system. Still, it was a local favorite. Everyone in Eastport loved hearing stories about The Night Hunter, whether they were true or not. And Nina suspected the Eastport Police Department wished they weren't. Everyone was just as wild as she was about the song local band Witch Hunt had written about him. Nina's calling Jerry every quarter of an hour also served as a way to interrupt Angela as she droned on about Lauren Vanderwall's party. Huh, Nina said now in response to Angela. You and Lauren are tight, right, Nina? Angela asked. You must be going to her party. It's tomorrow night. I heard Ryan Calder might be going. You know him, right? Or you've at least heard of him. Everybody's heard of him. He's so rich and hot. And I heard Lauren say he'd be dropping by. I've just got to meet him. Uh-huh, Nina said. Sometimes she said, uh-huh, to Angie instead of, huh, to vary her responses. The only reason she bothered responding at all was that Angela's mother was Nina's boss. Nina thought Angela was spoiled beyond belief. Look at the thing with the stool. Angela hadn't once offered to let Nina sit on it in four hours. Hang on a minute. Nina picked up the phone and dialed the number for the Calder Mall radio station. When Jerry at the desk picked up, she said, Hey, it's Nina at Overton's again. When are you guys going to play the Night Hunter by Witch Hunt? It's next up on the rotation. Jerry lied. They both knew it was a lie, but Nina said, Oh, great. Thanks, Jerry. And hung up. I mean, it's not that I want to meet him for his money or anything. Angela went on. I know his family built this mall and, well, everything in Eastport practically. It's just, he's so cute. Those blue eyes. And I feel so sorry for him with his parents getting killed last year. I know I could make him feel better. I bet you think you could, Nina thought. And it has way more to do with his bank account than those blue eyes of his. Not that Nina knew Ryan Calder that well either. She'd seen him at a few parties, but it felt weird about approaching him because he'd always been surrounded by girls just like Angie, trying to get into his wallet. But she knew she'd recognize those piercing eyes of his anywhere, especially since she'd seen them so many times, staring up at her from the pages of the Eastport News. There were always photos of him showing up, cutting the ribbon to a new hospital wing paid for by the foundation he'd started in his parents' memory. Look, Angie was saying, I could give you a lift tomorrow night to Lauren's if you want. Can't, Nina said. I'm working here tomorrow night. I know, Angie said. I meant after work. I'll pick you up and take you to the party. I don't know, Ange, Nina said idly leaning on the counter and gazing out of the store, across the atrium, where the mall's waterfall cascaded down from the second floor in front of the glass elevators. Mothers with young children, tired of pushing strollers, often sat there to rest, 
giving their toddlers pennies to throw into the pool. Across the pool, Eastport Bank was beginning to shut down for the night. Nina watched as the tellers put their closed signs up at their booths. Your mom's got me on the schedule to do inventory all day. I don't know if I'll feel much like going to a party. I'll probably be pretty tired. Nina didn't know why she was giving Angela such a hard time. Maybe it was because Angela hadn't given her a turn on the stool all night. Please? Angela looked desperate. Look, I'm not invited to Lauren's party. You are. If you go with me tomorrow night, I'll give you a ride home tonight, too. Then you won't have to take the bus home. You know how unsafe it is, waiting all alone at that bus stop here after all the stores close and everyone goes home. Nina did know. That's why she'd been thinking that what she needed was a boyfriend. A boyfriend with a car who could pick her up after work. It was no use saving up to buy her own car. Thanks to her mom, she needed to save every penny for tuition in the fall. But a boyfriend? That was doable. As she watched Rick, the security guard, begin to pull down the gates in front of the bank, she went over in her head the various boys she knew. Were any of them really boyfriend material? Not so much. Nina had her schoolwork to worry about after all, and this job. She didn't have time to cater to the whims of some guy, especially some spoiled rich guy like Ryan Calder. Unless, of course, she ended up with a guy like, well, the Night Hunter. But of course, that was ridiculous. The Night Hunter didn't have a girlfriend. How did the song go? He rides alone, just a rolling stone. Yeah, and Rolling Stones didn't hang out with high school girls, even seniors who were only a few credits away from graduating. But if he'd really saved all those people from those violent criminals just by showing up at the right time and looking intimidating, just say you'll come with me, Angela said, breaking in on Nina's thoughts. I'll get to the party and you'll get home safe. I'll feel a lot less guilty about leaving you waiting at that dark bus stop. Nina thought that if Angela were really as nice as she pretended to be, she'd just give her a ride home without making her promise to escort her to Lauren's party first. Nina's house was actually on the way to Angela's, so it wasn't like it would be any trouble. But she supposed this was how rich people got that way, never giving away anything for free. The Overtons were among the richest families in Eastport, rumored to be second wealthiest only to Ryan Calder, sole heir to the Calder family fortune now that his parents had been killed in that horrible burglary gone awry last year. Yet Nina had noticed Angela was almost always first in line whenever any other store in the mall was having a free giveaway of anything. Uh, that's okay, Nina said, lifting up the phone to call the Calder Mall radio station again and so end her conversation with Angela. I'll grab a ride with Katie from the bank or someone. What did she want to go to a stupid party at Lauren's for, anyway? None of those people wanted to hang out with her anymore, now that she was broke. It was better for Angela to learn now that Lauren and those guys, the Ryan Calders of the world, would only be your friend when you were on top of the world. As soon as you hit bottom, like Nina had, thanks to her mom, it was, see ya, wouldn't want to be ya. It was as she was waiting for Jerry to pick up that Nina noticed something curious happening across the atrium. A tall man in a long black trench coat had come striding down the concourse, heading with decided purpose toward the bank, the gates of which Rick hadn't fully pulled down. Something was wrong with his face. At first, Nina couldn't figure out what it was. Then, a second later, she figured it out. He was wearing... A mask. A terrible, grinning clown mask. It was as she realized this that the tall man ducked beneath the half-lowered gate in front of the Eastport Bank. When Rick, the security guard, stepped forward to say something to him, the man pulled something long and skinny from the depths of the black leather trench coat and pointed it at him. That's when Rick put his hands in the air. Oh! Nina cried. A physical shock seeming to jolt through her, not unlike the time she accidentally stuck her finger in the electrical socket while plugging in the toaster. Oh my God! This is Jerry, Jerry said, answering the phone she still held to her ear. Oh my God, Jerry, Nina said into the phone. 
He's robbing the bank. He, someone's robbing the mall branch at Eastport Bank. Who is this? Jerry asked. Nina, is that you? It's me, Nina said. Her lips felt numb. She watched as the man with the gun made Rick lie down on the bank floor. Call 911. Someone's robbing the bank. Are you kidding me? Jerry wanted to know. Is this a joke because I wouldn't play that Night Hunter song? No, it's not a joke, Nina cried. Even as Angela, who'd seen what was going on, had dived behind the counter and was tugging on Nina's arm to do the same. It's happening right now. There's a man in a clown mask wearing a black leather trench coat robbing the bank. He has a gun. Call 911 right now. Oh, never mind. I'll do it. Slamming the phone down into its cradle, Nina picked it back up and dialed, then handed the phone to Angela, crouched behind the register. Wh what are you doing? Angela demanded, staring at the phone as if it were a snake about to bite her. I'm going out there to see what I can do to help, Nina said. Tell 911 what's going on. Are you insane? Angela demanded as Nina slipped out from behind the counter. It's him. It's the night hunter. No, it isn't. Nina said, instantly incensed. The night hunter helps people. He doesn't rob them. But they say he wears a mask, and that guy... Night hunter wears a mask so he won't be recognized and punished for being a vigilante. Nina snapped. Of all the people she could have been forced to work with, why did it have to be Angela Overton, the stupidest girl on the planet? And it's a black mask, not a clown mask. Now stay here. W where are you going? Angela whispered. What are you going to do? You can't do anything to help those people. You're not the night hunter. Nina wished she were. She wished she were the night hunter. She'd stop the man holding up the bank. She'd force her mother to get her college money back from the boyfriend she'd given it to. She'd also have a cool motorcycle to ride around on. The first thing she'd do as the night hunter would be to quit working at Overton's. I'm not the night hunter, she said. But I can try to make sure that man doesn't hurt anyone. The night hunter did it. Why couldn't she? Her heart was pounding in her chest. How she was going to do this, she had no idea. Just talk to the operator. Have they picked up? You're crazy, Angela said, shaking her head, her eyes glittering. Just stay here. You can't leave me alone. I I'll tell my mother. Through the phone, Nina could hear a voice asking, Ma'am, are you there? Ma'am, this is 911. How can I help you? Tell them what's going on, Nina said, nodding to the phone Angela still clutched in her hands. I have to go see what I can do to help. You'll be all right here. Just tell the police to hurry. Don't leave me, Angela wailed. But Nina was already walking out of the store and heading around the waterfall and pool toward the bank. It was odd listening to the music playing over the mall's sound system, the light rock Jerry always played when it was late. He'd only put on the good stuff now, when the stores had begun closing and customers were starting to head home. Tonight, while watching a man in a trench coat and clown mask forcing the bank tellers to come out from their booths. That's Katie, Nina thought, as she saw the man in the mask grab one teller who hadn't moved quickly enough and push her roughly to the floor. Katie just had a baby last spring. Shoppers were coming toward her end of the mall, and they had kids. Nina knew she had to do something. She had to do something to warn people away from this end of the mall. That's what the night hunter would do. He'd try to help. Why hadn't Jerry, stupid Jerry, made an announcement over the sound system? Had he even bothered calling the police? Then, as she glanced around in desperation, she saw it. Of course. The fire alarm on the wall by the courtesy telephone. This wasn't a fire. But the system would go off mall-wide, and shoppers would know to evacuate. She'd stay put and warn them not to use this exit. Nina ran for the alarm and pulled it. A split second later, the alarm was sounding in ear-splitting whoops, accompanied by flashing strobe lights for the hearing impaired. The shoppers who'd been approaching her end of the mall stopped in their tracks. Waving her arms, she signaled for them to go back the way they'd come. They turned and did so. Confused, but obedient. It was working. She'd done it. She could barely hear herself think, but she'd done it. The bank robber wasn't bound to appreciate it very much, but who cared what he thought? 
She'd saved innocent people from getting caught up in an armed bank heist, just like the night hunter would have done. She glanced at Overton's to see what Angela was doing, but there was no sign of her, still hiding behind the register counter. Well, that was all right, as long as she'd let emergency services know what was going on. Inside Eastport Bank, everyone was lying on the floor with their hands over their heads. They all appeared to be breathing. Nina hadn't heard any gunshots. There was no sign of the robber. Nina assumed he was wherever the money was, stuffing it into his pockets or whatever bags he brought along. As long as help came soon, she didn't... That's when the arm, rock hard like iron, clamped around her throat, and she was dragged backward until she was pressed up against a long, muscular body. Something small and circular was held against her temple. This... Nina realized, just wasn't her day. Are you the one who set off that damned alarm? A hoarse voice rasped close beside her ear. Nina flinched. She didn't need to turn her head to know who had grabbed hold of her. She could see a bit of red clown fluff sticking out past the mask from the corner of one eye, just like she could see the gun he was pressing to her head. Yes, she managed to croak. It was hard to talk with the man in the trench coat's arm pressing so tightly against her throat. She'd instinctively thrown up both hands in order to try to pull that arm away, but it was no use. It was like trying to move a two-ton boulder. You'd better get out of here. The police are on their way, she hoped. Not without a hostage, Clown Mask hissed. It was kind of hard to hear him over the whooping of the fire alarm, but his mouth was so close to her ear she could feel his hot breath singeing her skin. You really don't want to take me as your hostage, Nina advised him. I'd make a terrible hostage. Yeah? Clown Mask sounded amused. Who do you suggest I take instead? One of your friends from inside the bank? Nina shook her head, her heart pounding. Not Katie. She had that new baby. And not Rick, either. He had a heart condition, and kids at home, too. What about your friend in the dress shop there, huh? Clown Mask breathed. He was pushing her as he spoke, pushing her down the concourse, past Overton's, where she could see the top of Angela's head peeking out over the counter, the telephone still clutched to one ear. Should we go in there and swap you for her? Would you like that better, huh? No, Nina said sullenly. Whatever Clown Mask had planned for her... And Nina didn't kid herself that it was going to be anything too pleasant. Angela wouldn't last a minute. And if she herself happened to live through it, and Nina wasn't betting she was going to, it would scar her way less than it would Angela. Because Angela, whose loving parents only made her work this single weekend shift at their shop to teach her responsibility, had never known hardship in her life. Except the hardship of having not been invited to Lauren Vanderwall's party. Nina hoped Angela would have a very nice time there, without her. I didn't think so, Clown Mask said, with a low sound in his throat that Nina could only assume was a chuckle. He continued to push her along past the waterfall, toward the side exits. They burst through the twin doors together, and Nina was greeted with a blast of cold night air in her face, air that was only going to get colder since she didn't have a coat on, and the welcome relief of no more fire alarm sound. She was also greeted by the wail of a police siren as a squad car skidded to a halt in the parking lot in front of them. Someone had gotten through to emergency services, at least. Clown Mask, who'd loosened his grip on her throat only slightly, now tightened it. A young police officer flung himself out from behind the wheel and, using the car as a shield, pointed his service revolver at them. Stay where you are, he yelled his voice strangely soft after the loudness of the alarm inside. Put down your weapon, nice and slow. I have a better idea, Clown Mask said to the police officer. You put down your weapon, or I'll blow a hole in this girl's head. How about that? The police officer, who looked barely old enough to have graduated from high school, let alone the academy, seemed confused. Nina could hear other sirens in the distance, but it sounded like it would be a while before they got anywhere close. That's what I thought, Clown Mask said, sounding smug. Now, 
This young lady and I are going to walk over to my car real slow. And you're going to let us. Or like I said, I'll splatter her brains all over the front doors of Calder Mall. And I don't think your chief would like it if I did that. Do you? The cop said nothing. He continued to keep his gun pointed at them, however, as Clown Mask dragged her toward his getaway car, a beat-up four-door sedan parked illegally along the curb right next to where they'd been standing. If there'd actually been a cop patrolling the mall's parking lot, he'd have gotten a ticket and been towed. But all the cops were busy on the far side of town, trying to stop real crimes. The kind of crimes the night hunter had finally gotten so sick of reading about in the paper, he put on a mask and decided to go and fight them himself. And now look what was happening over at the mall. Listen, Nina said in a low voice to her captor. Let me go now. He won't shoot you. He's too scared. And you'll make better time without me. Nice try, sweetie, Clown Mask said with a chuckle. Now get in the car. Nina knew the last thing she ought to do was get inside that car. But from the way she'd seen him push Katie down back in the bank, she also knew that he wasn't going to be shy about using that gun, even with a cop standing a few dozen yards away. She let him shove her into the passenger seat of the sedan. It's all right, she told herself. I'll jump out when we slow down to take a corner. It would hurt, but it would be better than whatever waited for her at the end of this. Then, Clown Mask was in the driver's seat, one hand on the wheel while the other continued to point the gun at her head. As they took off, his tires spun in the bits of sand left over from a recent snowfall. Nina barely had time to buckle her seatbelt before he accelerated. He laughed bitterly at this, as if to say she had more important things to worry about than being in a car crash, which she supposed was true. Then... With a spray of sand and gravel, the sedan careened from the parking lot, heading down 95 and away from the mall, the lights of which grew faint in the distance. Nina held on to her seatbelt, conscious of the gun still pointed at her temple. Not yet, she told herself. Soon. He has to slow down sometime. And then she'd jump and run for all she was worth. You're never going to make it. She told Clown Mask as he swerved to merge into evening traffic. She was sure no one suspected that they were slowing down for a psychotic bank robber. Clown Mask just chuckled. In this town? With these cops? Watch me. He had a point. Eastport's police department was stretched to the limit, with barely enough men and women to cover routine patrols, let alone any additional emergencies that might occur. The city was bankrupt. And the mayor, in his infinite wisdom, had cut back on city workers first. The police department had been the first to see major layoffs. I'll be home counting my pay off before Jeopardy, Clown Mask said with a sneer. And what about me? Nina asked, in a tight voice. She knew she wasn't going to like his answer. Still, she was hoping he'd lie to her. He didn't. You? He used the mouth of the pistol to push back some of her dark hair so he could get a better look at her face. You, I'm starting to like. Oh no, thought Nina. They were going 80 miles an hour down the fast lane. There was no way she could jump out at this speed and survive. And death, to Nina, did not seem preferable to the alternative at this point. There still might be opportunities for escape when they got to his house or wherever they were going. There was still hope. He liked her, or thought she was pretty, or whatever. She could get out of this, if she played her cards right. She could still get out of this. There was still a chance she might live. What the hell? Clown Mask asked a second later, abruptly removing the gun from her hair and glancing urgently into the rearview mirror. Nina looked back, but couldn't see what was alarming him. She'd hoped to see the red glare of police sirens, but instead, she saw only the single headlight of a motorcycle. True, it seemed to be tailgating them, but that wasn't anything to get upset about. Then, she remembered. He rides alone, just a rolling stone. The night hunter was rumored to ride a motorcycle sometimes. Other times, at least according to eyewitnesses who swore they weren't making it up, he drove some kind of armored vehicle 
like an SUV tank. But it was too much to hope that the night hunter had somehow managed to find them out of all the cars on the interstate when even the cops hadn't been able to. Nina swallowed down the sudden hope that had swelled inside her. She had experienced far too much disappointment in recent months to allow her spirits to be crushed that way again. There was only one person in this life, she knew, who you could count on. One. And that was yourself. If she was going to get out of this, she would have to do it on her own. This guy's riding my ass, Clown Mask muttered, switching lanes abruptly. But Nina could tell by the high beam in the rearview mirror and the loud roar behind them that the move had done no good. What's with this guy? Clown Mask demanded and switched lanes again. The motorcycle stayed right behind him, the roar from its engine seeming to envelop them, reverberating in Nina's chest. Nina couldn't help it. She began to feel hopeful. It was an emotion she hadn't allowed herself to feel in a long, long time. Maybe, she said. It's the Night Hunter. What? Clown Mask asked, distractedly, as he tried to make his way back to the passing lane. You know, Nina said. The Night Hunter. That vigilante who's been making citizens arrests of criminals the cops haven't been able or had time to arrest. He left that crime boss Vincent Gamboni tied up in his own car by the docks last week, along with a boatload of $700,000 worth of stolen goods. You're kind of small potatoes, Nina added, compared to him. But then, you are adding kidnapping to grand larceny, which are both felonies. Shut the hell up, Clown Mask said, pushing a button to bring the driver's side window down. I'm just saying, Nina said. A known drug dealer who's been wanted for murder and aggravated assault and on the run for three years? The Night Hunter found him and brought him in with no shots fired. He's that good. And you think you're going to get away? In your little clown mask? Nina laughed. She couldn't help it. Which was when Clown Mask leaned out the driver's side window and fired a shot behind them in the direction of the relentlessly pursuing motorcycle. The sound of the report was so loud that Nina screamed and flung both hands over her ears. What are you doing? She shrieked. Are you trying to get us both killed? Drive, Clown Mask said. Only he'd ripped off his mask in order to take better aim at his prey, and now Nina could see his irregular features. The badly reset broken nose, the two small, beady eyes blinking at her with a glint of desperation. I'm going to kill this bastard. Take the wheel. Before Nina had time to regret what she'd said, she'd only meant to scare him, after all. Her captor had slithered halfway out the driver's side window and was unloading his pistol in the direction of the man on the motorcycle. If she didn't want them to careen into the cars on either side of them, Nina had no choice but to seize the wheel of the car and slam her foot on the gas. But since she could no more allow him to kill the night hunter than she could allow him to kill her, she yanked violently on the wheel, swerving right. And then, praying to a god she wasn't entirely sure she believed in anymore, she cut across three lanes of traffic. Horns blared as cars veered out of their way, barely missing them. What the hell are you doing? Her captor slithered back inside the car to shout at her. He seized the wheel, wrestling it from her grasp. But Nina wouldn't give up. She gave it another violent tug while pressing down with all her might on the gas, aiming the car for a copse of trees she could see rushing toward them from the darkness alongside the road. All the while, she was praying, Please don't let me die. Please don't let me die. Please don't let me die. Clown Mask responded by striking her hard against the side of her head with the butt of his gun. Instinctively, she released the wheel and let go of the gas, seizing the side of her face and recoiling in pain and confusion as her vision swam in blackness. When her eyesight cleared a split second later, she experienced several agonizingly long moments of clarity as the car zoomed off the highway, bounced over the shoulder, and dove into the trees toward which she'd aimed it. She only had time to fling up both arms in a useless attempt to protect her head before the car landed with a stunningly hard force, a deafening crunch of metal, and a splinter of shattering glass. And this time, when the blackness came, it consumed her. When Nina opened her eyes, she heard the sound of cars passing in the distance, and somewhere closer by, the gentle cascade of running water. 
Her head ached, and it took a few seconds for her vision to focus. When it finally did, the first thing she saw was a pair of blue eyes staring at her from a field of darkness. At first she thought she must be in a cave or a movie theater. Why else would it be so dark? Then she realized that it was nighttime and she was outside. There was something warm over her body, but her face felt the chill, and so did the places where her body connected with the cold, hard ground. She also realized that the reason the blue eyes appeared to be looking at her from a field of darkness was that they were peering at her from behind two holes. The man kneeling beside her was wearing a black rubber mask. She gave a start, and the man, who she realized was cradling her upper body, trying to keep her head supported, said in a low voice that was more rasp than whisper, an ambulance is on the way. You're going to be all right. Just keep still. Nina wasn't sure she believed him. She hurt all over. She tried moving her legs. It would be just her luck if she turned out to be paralyzed and was relieved to find that she could bend both knees with some effort. Hey, the man with the black mask rasped, sounding as if he were laughing a little. I thought I said to keep still. Which was all well and good for him to say, but he hadn't been in that car with a gun pointed to his head a few minutes. Had it only been minutes ago? Where is he? Nina demanded, turning her head. Big mistake. Waves of pain shot through it. He's gone, the man in the mask said. Another man in a mask, Nina thought with a groan. Too many masks for one night. Don't worry about him. You're safe now. Nina couldn't see the wreckage of Clown Mask's car, but she could smell it. The acrid smoke filling the night air. Is he dead? She asked, hopefully. No, he said, and again there was a chuckle in his voice. He can't have gotten far. Once help comes for you, I'll look for him. Nina tensed. You should go. You should look for him now before he gets away. Don't worry about me. I'll be all right. Hey, her rescuer said, laughing now. You put your life on the line for me back there. Hanging with you until the ambulance comes is the least I can do, Nina. She blinked, trying to remember. Had she saved his life? Oh, right. The night hunter. Clown mask had been shooting at him and she'd steered the car into the trees. The night hunter must have pulled her from the burning car and he was here with her now, waiting for the ambulance. She had finally met him. Only, how... She said, blinking with confusion. Do you know my name? He didn't say anything for a beat. Your wallet, he said. Sorry, I looked through it. I wanted to know to whom I owed my life. How did you know? She asked. About me. That I was in the car with him. I heard about the kidnapping over the police scanner, he said. I picked the two of you up as he merged onto 95. It was pretty easy. You were the only ones going a hundred miles an hour. That was brave what you did, driving the car into the trees when he started shooting. He was... He said he was going to take me with him, Nina said. She didn't want to go into detail. Looking into those blue eyes, as cold as the air around her, she could see that she didn't have to. The mouth beneath the form-fitting rubber mask, the only part of him that wasn't swathed in black, set into a firm line. He knew. He knew exactly what she meant. The pain in her head was pulsating. The smoke from the burning car seemed to have seared her lungs, though she knew he'd pulled her away in time. Finally, Nina added, Besides, he was shooting at you. You're not bulletproof. She thought of the song. Are you? Sort of, he said, and tapped his chest, which made a strange, echoing sound. Kevlar body armor. So next time, don't ram into any trees on my account. No need. Though I do appreciate it. His mouth twisted into a grin, convincing Nina that without the mask, he'd be handsome. Handsome, but also frightening. There was a considerable breadth of shoulder beneath the black body armor, not to mention the fact that his chest seemed about half a mile wide. Still, for a moment, Nina saw something warm in those icy blue eyes. 
And then she heard the siren and saw the red and white flash. Looks like your ride's here, he said, and she could feel him gently lowering her head. I've got to go. I'm not particularly well liked by the local authorities. Besides, I have to go look for the driver of this illegally parked vehicle over here and have a few words with him. Wait, Nina said, her heart speeding up. You'll be all right, Nina, he assured her, squeezing her hand. I've left Flair so they'll know how to find you. Not that, Nina said. She could feel the darkness closing in again, but she fought against it. Who are you? I don't even know. Oh, he said with a smile, as voices sounded in the thick tangle of woods around them. I think we'll see each other again. And then he was gone. Just as the first emergency service worker stepped into the clearing into which he'd carried her and cried, Miss, it's all right, Miss, we're here now. For a few minutes, Nina wasn't sure he'd ever even been there. She thought she might have imagined the whole thing. Except that later, as they were loading her onto the ambulance, one of the EMS workers lifted the edges of the thick black blanket that had been wrapped so securely around her and asked, Where did this come from? It's not one of ours. And then Nina saw, at the same time that everyone else on the scene did, that it wasn't a blanket at all. That's a cape said one of the ambulance drivers. You don't think... One of the firemen began, but another cut him off. Don't start. We weren't the first on the scene, said another. Someone pulled her out of the car, stopped her bleeding, and laid those flares. Nina would have told them. She would have said who it was, and gladly. But she was too busy thinking about something else. One of the EMTs had asked her for her ID... And when she'd reached for her wallet, she realized she'd left it back at the mall, along with her purse, her cell phone, and everything else she'd brought with her to work that night. So the night hunter had lied about how he'd known her name. He'd known her name because he'd known her. He'd known her because she knew him. They'd met before. Of course. Those eyes... Those icy blue eyes from all those photos in the newspaper. Those blue eyes that, far into their depths, had hidden wells of warmth. She'd know them anywhere. And he was right. They would be seeing each other soon. Tomorrow night, at Lauren Vanderwalls's party. And this time, Nina wouldn't feel weird about walking up and saying hi. Tuition by Walter Sorrells Read by Oliver Wyman Marlon's phone vibrated as the third tumbler clicked. He looked at his phone. It was Mom. Great. He thumbed the green button. What? He whispered, still twisting the knob on the safe with his other hand. It's your mother. Couldn't you be a little more polite when you answer the phone? I know who it is, he whispered. What do you want? I'm kind of busy here. He glanced at his watch. 8.37. Time was running out. It was an antique Mosler Model 37B, the kind they used in banks back in the old days. In a perfect world, he would have drilled it. But drills made too much noise. The place where they were doing the job, the headquarters of International Logic Corp, was patrolled by well-trained security guards and protected by all kinds of motion sensors and sound sensors and heat detectors. My book club's running late, his mom said. You think you can pick up your brother from chess team practice? Marlon sighed. Mom, I'm busy. Doing what? Doing what? Okay, 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 he hissed. Among the other important things that she didn't remember about today, apparently she didn't even remember that he was on a job. I'll get Ray Ray. God. Marlon closed his phone, wiped his brow on his sleeve. Chess team, for God's sake. His fingers were cramped and tired from slowly twisting the dial on the safe. He was monitoring the sound of the mechanism through earphones. 
but he also had an electronic monitor with a little gauge on it that twitched at the tiniest sound. The Mosler was a beautifully made safe, old-school craftsmanship, with amazingly quiet tumblers. Only a real master could crack it by ear. Who was that? Irving said. Can we be quiet, Irving? Marlin said. I'm trying to concentrate. Whatever. Irving was a tall old guy, like 40 or 50, who sat on the desk swinging his legs aimlessly. Marlin wasn't sure why his father had sent Irving along on this job. Marlin could have done this one by himself. Marlin waggled his fingers, trying to get the kinks out, then began working on the safe again, slowly twisting the dial. He was close now. One more number, and they could get the stuff and get out of here. After a few minutes, Irving hissed, Hey, guards! Marlin clicked off his flashlight and froze, his heart going into overdrive. The guards were only supposed to come around once an hour. Had somebody tipped them off? The footsteps grew closer and closer. There were two of them talking that was a good sign if they'd been tipped off they'd have their guns out and would be moving silently still the footsteps stopped he could see two shadows in the band of light that came through the crack underneath the door they were standing right in front of the office not 15 feet from where he was crouched his dad had assured him this was going to be a big score if he pulled this one off, his dad swore that he wouldn't have to do any of this crap again. This one job would pay for college, the full ride. Marlin had been admitted to Princeton in the fall, but the financial aid didn't cover everything. Even after the loans and the grants, he was going to have to come up with 18 grand every single year. 18 grand? How could anybody afford the place? Outside the room, one of the guards said, What's that? Did you leave that there? No, the other guard said. It wasn't here before. You sure? Of course I'm sure. Well, open the door, you idiot. Something's not right here. I don't have the keys. I thought you had the keys. I thought you had the keys. Do I have to do everything around here? The two guards walked away, bad-mouthing each other. They didn't sound very worried. But still, he wasn't sure what they'd seen out there in the hallway. Maybe Irving left something out there. The guy was so sloppy. Marlin never could figure out why his father kept Irving on in his crew. Marlin's dad was the kind of guy who always made sure every detail was right. Every detail. Ding. The elevator bell sounded. Then the elevator doors closed and the voices of the two security guards disappeared. We got to clear out, kid, Irving said. They're on to us. Marlin felt sick. He was close. So close. No, I'm almost there. Kid, your old man will kill me if I let you get pinched. No. Marlin kept working the dial, eyes glued to the gauge on the monitor. What do you mean, no? That's my tuition in there. That's my ticket out of this crap. Crap? You know what your old man went through to teach you everything you know? Safes, explosives, locks, alarms. Your family has been in this business for three...